All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, this morning. So I just want to quickly get into it straight away. We've got a lot to cover. But uh, those song, the singing this morning was great, you know. It uh, powers me up, gives me encouragement. Like, whoa, like it's like the top, the top 10 Baptist songs, right? And you get encouraged by that. But this morning, I want to touch on eternal security. Uh, I have a few things I already wanted to plan out for this year to preach on on my schedule. Eternal security is one of them. And two weeks ago, I was speaking to a Seventh-day Adventist uh, about salvation. And the, we were going back and forth. And we, at first, I thought they, we agreed on salvation, that they believed it was by faith alone. But then we got into eternal security. It, it became apparently very clear that I, I don't think that person was actually saved. And so we tried to go back and forth on that. So this is sort of what spurred me. And it's sort of, uh, I guess, in my fiery indignation, makes me want to destroy this. But eternal security is sort of one of the want to touch on this morning. So Hebrews 10 is what we, re- we, what, uh, what we read. I just want to quickly touch on the main parts I want to... So this first part, I just wanted to quickly go through some verses that help us uh, easily acknowledge that th- this is surely once saved, you're always saved. And obviously there's a lot, so I won't go through all of them. Uh, but so we'll go through a few and then I'll make some comments. But Hebrews 10.10, 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. I don't think I'd need much commentary there. It's pretty clear that, you know, for those that are sanctified, uh, we, we are... We are sanctified once for all through Jesus Christ. And that after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. And verse 14, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So I don't think we can lose our salvation based on these verses. Let's continue on a few more. I want to touch on John 3, 16, John 3, 15, John 5, 24. Uh, You know, the everlasting, he shall have everlasting life. Uh, The usual comment against that from these people that believe you can lose your salvation, they usually say, the, the life is everlasting, but it's your possession of that is not everlasting. So I want to use other verses also uh, besides those. I don't think that's what the, those verses mean, but I, it's very clear that that person, present tense and future tense for that sake, is they have everlasting life. But let's read a few verses here. John four thirteen to 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Speaking of the well from that water. But whosoever, shall, uh, but whosoever drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So the thing I wanted to comment on is that if we can lose our salvation, then this verse 14 wouldn't make sense. It says we shall never thirst. Whereas comparing to verse 13, that they will thirst again. So this wouldn't make sense if we can lose our salvation. Whosoever drink of this water, whosoever is saved, shall never thirst. And it wouldn't make sense if we can lose our salvation, because then we'll be thirst again. Another similar passage, John 6, 34. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Once again, the same things that said fire. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and, I will, uh, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So another verse that says, in no wise cast out. There's no way we can lose our salvation. Once again, another clear passage. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. So losing nothing is referring to the latter part of the verse, but that he should raise it up at the last day. That one day we will have... Uh, we'll we'll be having our new bodies, right? Everyone will be resurrected. We'll be with the Father. We'll be with Jesus Christ in the air. Right? So that's what it would be referring to. But John 10, another similar passage to what we saw here, and 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 no wise cast out. And we see that Jesus and the Father in that reference in John 6. But in John 10, another very popular verse about eternal security. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. I was listening to a Trent Horn and a James White debate on this, uh, never lo- like you can lose your salvation. 
And for some reason, they still think that besides everyone else, that set the person themselves can pluck themselves out of God's hand. But I don't think that's, that's ever the case here. When you read this, it's no man, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Right? And no, no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So I think it's very clear that we cannot lose our salvation based on these verses. Uh, Romans 5, 20, 21, another clear verse. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin had reigned unto death, unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So this verse is saying that, you know, if your sin is here, as I say, believer, in the flesh, what we do in the flesh, but God's grace, Jesus' grace is always greater. No matter how much sin we have, God's grace is even greater. But it says that, it might, uh, that even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. By Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's just once again another showing of what we have salvation once, uh, once for all. Now, once you are saved, yes, you are always saved. All right, so those are some passages. Obviously, no doubt, a lot more with all the everlasting life verses, ever, uh, eternal life verses we can go to. But uh, I just wanted to quickly touch on that. So the next thing I wanted to touch on is the dual nature of the believer. So once you are saved, we have obviously the, the flesh we still live in, nothing, nothing physically changes, you know, we're still in the body, but the spirit changes, right? And then we see this uh, in, in a few verses, John 1, 12, another popular verse, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe his name. So in this next section, I've sort of uh, put the, the things of the flesh blue and the things of the spirit red, just to help us understand, but... Basically, in John 1, 12, you know, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you, know, you become the son of God, even to them that believe his name, right? So, in John 3, another, uh, when he's speaking to Nicodemus, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Uh, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. But John, Jesus is saying here, that someone that's physically born is the first, first time they're born. And then born again is when you believe in Christ, which is born of the Spirit. And that's why in verse 6, I think it outlines it a, a bit more clearer. That if you're born of water, which is would you're born of the flesh, in verse 6. But if you're born of the Spirit, is as it says in the second half of uh, verse 6, that, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit, which is what we see in John 1, 12. That if you believe in Him, uh, you, you become the sons of God. And that's a spiritual thing. That's why we see in 2 Corinthians 5, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we, uh, know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So this would be referring to the spiritual uh, being inside you now, the new man. All right, so we see this in John 4. A few more verses that we'll go through. John 4. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit, and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So once again, uh, God is showing us, and the Bible is showing us that uh, believer, we will, will be worshiping Him in spirit, because we are in the new man in the spirit, right? It says this in Galatians 6, 5, 15, for when Galatians was particularly teaching that you had to add circumcision to, on top of what Christ did for you, which we, knew, we know that in Galatians 5, Paul is writing that, no, that's not the case, right? He, that Christ has become of no effect unto you, he's fully justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. But Galatians 6.15, for, for in Christ, Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, which would be fleshly things, but a new creature, the spiritual thing. And uh, the reason why I brought this up, if you jump back a few verses down, Galatians 6.11, ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand, as many as desire to make a, a fair show in the flesh... They constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature." And once again, this is relating to the new man, the, the spiritual person, Colossians 3, another verse that we can go to that shows this. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. 
once again, this showing you the spiritual and the physical, this, the inner man, the old man, the new man. Right? Ephesians 4. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversations, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and in true, and true holiness. So Paul would be writing here to say, you know, though you are living physically in the, in the flesh, the old man, put it off, you know, take up your cross, die daily, you know, uh, you should take up your cross daily, right? And put on the new man. So it says this, and I like the end of this verse, uh, the, the last verse of this chapter, another verse that shows us that, you know, we, we are saved even till the end, right? And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit resides in every believer, as we know. Uh, all right, so the next thing, continuing on with this my idea, but sort of touching it in a different way. Sin in the flesh, or, in the, or do we work in the Spirit? Are we sinning in the flesh, or are we working in the Spirit, right? Because we have this in 1 John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And many people that say that you can lose your salvation, I'll turn to this particularly, because they say, hey, see, you, can't, uh, you, can't, you cannot sin if, you, if you're born of God. But if we're all honest with ourselves, you know, we're all, like, we all sin daily. You know, it says in, the, in James, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And, uh, you know, that, um, that if you know to do good and you, uh, you don't do it, you know, to you it is sin. That's what James also says. So even just being lazy, or the things that you should be doing that you're not doing, you're sinning. We do that every day. So they usually turn to this verse, and it, it, it just proves that no one is saved. But we know that's not the case, right? That's the, it's talking about the new man. Hey, the new man, the inner man, the spiritual being, the son of God, is not, uh, the, doesn't commit sin. 1 John 5, 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. So same thing, John uh, is just repeating himself in this case. But he that uh, is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. So once again, he that is begotten of God, he that believes on Jesus Christ, is one that doesn't sin. Right? So I think what sort of lays this down is Romans 7. Romans 7, you know, a lot of... Uh, what I, what I, whenever I turn to this chapter, this verse, in, in Romans 7, or this passage rather, in Romans 7, you know... I like how the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And we think rap these days is a new thing in the 80s that came up. But you know, Paul here is rapping, you know? <laughs> Not really, but, but yeah. Romans 7, this is a very tricky verse. A lot of word, word, uh, word, wording is a bit tricky. But let's go through it. But it's showing you the new man, the spiritual man, and the old man, which Paul is both in, right? As he's writing this as well. Or Tertius is writing this, but obviously through, uh, from Paul. But Romans 7, 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold unto sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would that, uh, that do I not, but what I hate that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And this verse, verse 13, you know, what I find interesting about this, the person that I actually remember quoting this the most, or that's most vivid in, in, in my mind, is actually the pastor that sent out uh, Victor, uh, Pastor Mark Tossel. And I always remember him, whenever I read this, I, he's always in my mind when I read verse 18. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And you remember, if you remember, when I quoted James earlier before, you know, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We see this in verse 18, that Paul's not doing what he should do. Verse 19, For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do, but sin that dwelleth in me. And then Paul continues on. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And this is the part I wanted to focus on in verse 23. But I see another law in my members, the physical, the old man, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall be deliver me from the body of this death? And then he goes on to say, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So we see these two natures fighting against each other. You know, the flesh, the old man versus this, uh, the new man, the spiritual being, the son of God, right? So we see that. And, uh, and that's just what I want to point out. That's what we see when we see in, in John, he's saying, you know, that is whosoever is born of God, 
uh, shall not commit sin, basically that's what we see. It's the, the new man who doesn't commit sin. So the reason why I want to jump to rewards and punishment also, let's, let's read a few verses first and then I'll make some comments. And John answered him saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name and he followeth not us. And we forbade him because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall drink, uh, shall, for whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. For that's very simple, right? Verse 41. Just giving a, a cup of water in Christ's name. And, and God, Jesus says, you will not lose your reward. If you can lose your salvation, then you can lose your reward, which is not the case, because we see this in 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, For we are labors together with God, ye are God's husbandry, are ye God's, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the foundation. Now if any man, which is, sorry, so this, I'd say verse 11 would be referring to, you know, when someone gets saved, that's the, Jesus Christ is the foundation. And so in verse 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort of it is, of what sort of it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So we do not lose our rewards, we cannot lose our salvation. And if we can sin, we would lose our rewards, which wouldn't make sense in this. All right? So in terms of rewards, we can't lose it because we are saved once forever when you build on Jesus Christ, right? The things that you do in the Spirit, the new man, the Son of God. But how about punishments? Proverbs 3, and this is sort of a part I want to comment on a lot. Proverbs 3, and we read in Hebrews 12 next. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son whom he delighteth. Uh, Hebrews 12, 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuke of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he? whom the Father chasteneth not. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. All right? I won't read, uh, continuing on, but basically the, the, the point I wanted to make is, if you can lose your salvation, what sin would God be punishing here, uh, the believers for, that you didn't lose your salvation for? You know, this wouldn't, this wouldn't make sense. If you're a child of God and you can lose your salvation, and you're no longer a child of God, how would you be punished for, for the sins that you do in the flesh if you're, you're for his, if you're his child. And especially if it's called chastening, right? You know, he dealeth with you as with sons. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. So the point I want to make is, and drive that home is, you know, if you can lose your salvation, how can God ever punish you with what you do on earth? You know, if you're not his child anymore. Because it says if you're not without chastisement, you're not his son. So would it make sense if you can lose your salvation and then God deals with you, right? It just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, so the next point, um, in 1 Corinthians 5, also showing you that uh, in the punishment of the flesh, sometimes God deals with, and the re reason why I want to bring this up, in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul was writing to the Corinthian church to cast out, you know, the one that was uh, fornicating with his uh, father's wife. So and to, to, to deliver one such as one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. But what we see here, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So once again, showing us that sometimes you get God will judge you in the flesh, but the Spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So once again, if you're a child of God, uh, you can't lose your salvation. And there's no way you can be punished if you could lose your salvation. Otherwise, how, that, how would Hebrews 12 and Proverbs 22 make sense? All right, so just wanted to quickly turn through those few points. Uh, some objections. All right, some, some, what some people say in some of the verses people bring up about, you know, these show you can lose your salvation. So let's go through a few. I won't go through every single one, but hopefully I went through the main ones. Uh, the lost and found. The lost and found is, another, is one that's very commonly used. And this passage is the same passage which would be the prodigal son, which we'll read later. But I won't touch on every, I won't go through the whole chapter, but we'll just touch on what we can. 
then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he found it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which is lost. I say, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, over ninety, ninety-nine, ninety and nine just persons which needeth, which need no repentance. So they usually refer to this one and the woman having uh, the lost coin and finding it is that you can lose your salvation. But it, there's no case here where it, it shows what the sheep is actually doing. It's just saying he got lost, right? So in what case is he? In what way is he lost? That is, is it lost that he's saved or lost that he's he's gone into the world? And I think if you read both, because look, a coin doesn't have a coin doesn't have a conscience to do wrong things, right? If you lose the coin, you just lose it. But if we go to the prodigal son, uh, which is in the same chapter about this, and I think it, uh, it clarifies this more. Um, let's see here. And a certain man, verse 11, and, a certain, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me and divided unto them his living. So this young son that we know, the prodigal son that he became to be, uh, what did he do? That he, there he wasted his substance in, in, with riotous living. And when he had all spent, spent all there arose a mighty famine in the land and, began, and he began to be in want. Right, so this person, he, he took up his insur- uh, inheritance and wasted it, right? And he wasted the inheritance of what he received. You know, he didn't wisely use it. He didn't, uh, he just wasted it completely. Some people say, see, this is someone that's like someone that loses their salvation. But if, throughout this whole thing, he's still called the son. Remember what we saw in John 1? That, um, that if you believe on Jesus Christ, you'll be, uh, that you're born of, born of God, right? That you're a child of God. This person in Luke 15 is still called the son, right? So he says, I will go unto my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against thee and before thee, right? So he came, he hit rock bottom and now he's going to go back to, to God in this sense go back to his father. Although he said in verse 19, I am no more worthy to be called thy son, make me as thy one of thy hired servants, he is still a son. You know, he might not be worthy in the flesh, but he is still a son, is the point I'm trying to drive home. Right, even his brother, you know, let's go, let's just quickly jump uh, a bit later on. Uh, In verse 27, sorry, in verse 27, and he said unto him, thy brother has come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. So that brother would be a saved person. How can he be a brother if, he's, if, he's, if, if his ex-brother lost his salvation for that sake? He's a brother, he's a son, he's saved once for all because he's born of God, right? So even if you waste your life, uh, obviously not recommended, you're still a child of God. You're still called a son of God. And you also have children, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's what I want to touch there. And that's what I think that the sheep is in the lost coin that uh, these things can happen, they go away, but they can come back, right? But they haven't lost their salvation, we don't see that. And so they also like to say, you know, in this case, James 2.17, that if it hath not works, is dead, being alone, faith, that's, uh, faith alone, right? They try to say, you need the works, especially Catholics, you need the works. How I liken to it, you know, like, like the prodigal son, you know, he, although he was supposed to be like uh, a servant, that he says, I'm not worthy to be more called our son, but should be like of the servants. And that's sort of like uh, how I would say is in this verse, faith, if, if I was to replace like faith as in, in a parable sense with a battery, right? Let's say there's a category of there's no battery, there's a battery, and it, that's like no charge at all, like it's completely used up and dead. And then there's a battery that's fully charged. And I'd say that these two people, the, the people that have the battery, right? The person that has, even though the, the person that's got no charge in their battery, and then the person that's got full charge in their battery, those people still have a battery, whereas the last person, the person that has no battery, has no battery, right? So how, how am I meant, meant to make this sense? Sorry, I know uh, if you have your phones right, you all have a battery in it. If it had no battery, there's no way to recharge it. So that phone would be useless at all. But if you had a battery, at least you can recharge it. These people had the faith and it can be recharged. And so in the case that I'm saying they have that battery, even though it's dead, even though it, it may not be functional, it can still be recharged. And so they have that faith. Likewise, 
if you're saved, yes, in the flesh, you can work, turn away from God, but uh, you can be recharged again, unless God takes you home early. So another one is the virgin and talents. Virgin and talents. And Victor touched this on a long time ago, but I just want to quickly bring it up. Um, it's about the ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And, and five of them were wise and five were foolish. And uh, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So the reason why I highlighted verse 4 in red was uh, throughout the Bible, it's always a common or uh, usually understood that oil is sort of representative of, what, of the Holy Spirit. Right? We're anointed when Samuel um, uh, anointed the king's soul and um, he used the oil and then the Spirit of God went on him. Right? So oil throughout the Bible is sort of a picture or an example of the Holy Spirit. So these wise people, the five wise, it seemed to be in a sense saved that they took their oil in their vessels, right? And so what happens was when the bridegroom came back, you know, um, let's see in verse 11, the, the foolish one, what did they say in verse 11? Afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us, the foolish ones. And he, said, and he answered and said to them, I, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. So these foolish ones with had, which had no oil, right? What's it like to? They're saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And Jesus says, I know, you, I, I know you're not. And that's what, like, what it says here in Re Matthew 7. It says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, right? Well, we saw what the, virgin, the foolish virgin saying. Have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So he says, I never knew you. And these, these, the foolish virgin says, Lord, Lord. So very, very good cross-reference there to show that these people were trusting in, in works. Um, but how about the, the talents, right? So for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents and to another... Uh, two and to another one and to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey so let's jump back uh, let's jump down to a few verses later about the one the person that had the one talent right because the other two the ten and the, the, uh, the five what I think that's referring to is you know that we see in the Bible that has faith to faith right and what we see in Hebrews 11 although that you have um, saving faith you can work on it which is what I thought the, the talent of the, t the ten and the five were, are an example of but how about the guy that had one talent? What did he do? And let us, let's explain it. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee, that thou art an hard man, reaping, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid the talent in the earth. Lo, there uh, thou hast, that is thine. And, and uh, the Lord in this, in this parable, uh, the, the point I really wanted to get to is um, in verse 27. Thou orders therefore to put my money to the exchanges and then at my coming I shall receive my own with usury. So usury in the Bible is interest. Every time you see the word usury uh, in, in, when it comes to money, it's interest. So when you put your money in the bank, it gains interest, right? So what is interest? It's when someone, particularly the bank, when you, usually with banks, when you put, give the money to the bank, they work for you. So this person should have put, you know, he shouldn't be working himself he, if he's going to put into usury, someone working for him, that would be Jesus Christ, right? And so Jesus Christ would be working and earning that reward for him. So that's where I think this person would be a good pic picture of that. He's someone who's not saved because he's not trusting on, you know, someone that, in the bare minimum, he's not trusting on someone that would work for him to bring increase. Whereas the other two, they had faith and they increased on their faith. Like what we see in Hebrews 11, the, the, the faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, but then you have a great list of people that did their faith in, in, in a physical sense, right? The outwardly appearance. All right, so that's what I think the Matthew 25, you know, the person that uh, hid his talent. All right, how about branch cast forth? And I like this one because I think now it should be a, a proof text of what uh, Christians would face if they, they're not bearing fruit in Christ. Every branch in me, so that's someone that's saved, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And we jump down to verse 16. This is where people like to jump to. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. 
So they say that they are burned is relating to hell. I don't think that's the case. I think hell in a general sense, that's oh, not hell, burned in a general sense is just the judgment of God, a punishment of God. And it could be to someone that's a believer, and I'll show you a few things soon. And it could uh, usually mean to someone that's an unbeliever. But I want to show you a few things about um, being burned, even to believers in a sense, but particularly in the Old Testament. Hebrews 12, this is sort of a warning, uh, not necessarily that God's going to punch us in fire, but it's showing us that we should, with reverence, let's just read it, Re verse 28, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So why is he saying that, that we should reverence God, uh, reverence him and have godly fear? For our God is a consuming fire. That's even to himself that God is a consuming fire to believers. All right? And Hebrews 11, this is sort of what uh, I wanted to jump to the, these next two verses. Obviously, Israel, you'll see pictures of people that aren't saved, uh, if you compare it to the New Testament, and people that are saved, and how does God deal with them, right? It's not always going to be the case, a perfect example, but nevertheless, uh, I think this is a good case for even believers being punished and being burnt. And that's just the judgment of God, a punishment of God. It should be a proof text, which is what I think John 15 would be. But Hebrews, uh, Numbers 11, verse 1, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. If you said complaining was a, a sin that you would be rejected and going to hell for, that, this, this, is not, this wouldn't be a good case, right? I don't think that would be the case, sorry. You know, complaining, everyone complains. Are, are we then, you know, reprobate? I, I don't think so, you know. The, I think this is a good case of believers. They're just continually annoying God. Uh, it displeased the Lord, and His anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them. So it's just about complaining. This isn't even about, you know, sodomy or turning to other gods. This is just complaint, right? And same thing in Numbers 21. You can read the verse prior but what the Lord punished him with. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of Israel uh, died. This is when Moses then set up that serpent on the bra uh, brass, brazen serpent. People just had to look on it, and then they were, they were healed, they were saved, right? But if you read earlier, they were just complaining to God in the same thing. You know, they were just speaking against God and that, you know, we came out of Israel, where's the water, where's the food? And then, you know, the Lord sent these fiery serpents, once again, showing you that, you know, God can, to even his own people, uh, as we see here, be a consuming fire, right? So just by complaining is one of them. But there's other ways we can be burnt that is not particularly uh, spiritual or like about hell. It says this in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, but if they cannot contain about, you know, people that aren't married, let them marry, for it is better, uh, for it is better to marry than to burn, right? So things that they, you don't want them to fornicate. Proverbs 6, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever sort of touch her there shall not be innocent. So a person that, you know, has their wife or the husband um, cheating on them, that person is going to be tormented. That person is going to be, in a sense, burned in his, in, in the, in his bosom, right? So that's what I would say. Like, you know, when you're, when you're facing the judgment of God, you're going to be tormented. You're going to be facing the judgment of God. All right, so let's, let's hear a few phrases some people like to say that, hey, these, you can lose your salvation. Look, how about these verses? Some of the phrases people like to say. Philippians 2, uh, let's just read the ending. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See? There you go, case closed. They say that, you can lose your salvation. But let's jump back. Let's see what the whole chapter is talking about. Um, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man in his own things, but every man also in the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant, and was make, made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, beloved, uh, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So, they go to here to show you that work salvation, you need to work it, or else you're gonna, you can be fearing and trembling, they can lose it as also. 
So the reason, but if you actually think, what I actually think this is, this passage is saying is that you work outwardly what your salvation is. You work your faith. You're showing what your faith, just like it's in Hebrews 11. You know, you're showing what your salvation is with fear and trembling because what? God, our God is a consuming fire. Because what is Philippians 2? It's talking about service. It's talking about being a servant. It's talking about Jesus Christ being a servant. So we should be a servant. That we show outwardly our, our faith with fear and trembling in the sense that God is a, a consuming fire, which is what we show here. That we, uh, we may serve God. Remember that Philippians 2? Service. That we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That's why we fear Him. You know, because He's God. And our God is a consuming fire. Not that we can lose our salvation. Not that we work for our salvation. But that we ought to outwardly show this salvation. And that's why we have in uh, Matthew 5.16... Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. All right, so Galatians 5. Let's just jump to another one. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So they like to say this, like, see, if you've fallen, that means you were once there. But I think in the context, they usually tripped up on the lettering of the law, but not the spirit of it. Galatians 5, we see this wouldn't make sense because if you had to work on top of what Christ has saved you with, um, which is what Galatians, 5, Galatians is all about. They're adding works to Christ. If you can lose your salvation in, by using this verse, they've completely missed the boat. Because they're saying, look, you've got to work. You've got to continue serving God. You've got to be in the faith. You've got to show your faith. But what is Galatians all about? What is the, the church of Galatians? They're adding works to Christ. So how would this make sense? Because if, if, if you're saying you're fallen from grace, but that fallen from grace would be adding works to Christ... That goes contrary to you saying you've got to work for Christ. So that it wouldn't make sense in this verse, right? Galatians 5, we see what they're fallen from. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, so be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. And I like verse 5 because this sort of makes it better. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. All right? So this is obviously not teaching what they would say because it wouldn't make sense. Because once again, as I said, you're adding works to Christ. And that's what Paul is saying, you're losing your salvation, you're, you're, you've fallen from grace from. But now these people that are saying you can lose your salvation because you have to add works to Christ, it just doesn't make sense. Right? So Paul is just saying, if you really believe that, then you're not saved. That's what Paul is actually saying in the spirit of this, uh, in chapter 5. All right, I heard this from a guy I spoke to on Thursday recently about, you know, God spinning you out. And this wouldn't make sense as well. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Oh, sorry, why did I jump there? Luke 3, uh, Revelation 3. So the guy was saying, look, if you're lukewarm, like you're half in and half out of church, you're, you're gonna, you're, God's going to spew thee out. You can lose your salvation there. But it doesn't make sense. Because God is saying that he would rather you be cold or hot. Would he, rather, would he rather you be not saved, if that was the case? No, we know that Christ wants salvation for every man. For who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, the Bible says. So this wouldn't make sense about salvation. God wants you to be, everyone to be saved. If that was, this was about salvation, then would he want you to be saved, uh, uh, lost, as, as in cold? It wouldn't make sense. So it's, once again, it's the flesh, the old man, or the new man and the spiritual being. Matthew 6, they say... Another thing um, about if you don't forgive other people, you will lose your salvation because you can forfeit the forgiveness of God. So if you actually read, for if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And another same passage is in, in Matthew 18. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. So once again, remember when I showed you earlier that in the prodigal son, he had a brother and he was still called a son? If you're not saved, you're no longer a brother. If you're not saved, you're no longer a child. He's no longer your father. So this wouldn't make sense. This is obviously speaking about the, the things in the flesh compared to the things in, in, the, in, the, in the spirit, right? I can't um, forgive uh, in, a, in a spiritual sense, people their sins, but as a brother in Christ, as someone in the flesh, you know, if someone does me wrong, I can say, okay, that, that's fine, you know, if you, if you come to me and say sorry, that's fine. 
But that's something that's done in the, in, in the, in the physical sense, the being, the phys not the spiritual, that we can't lose our, our, uh, our forgiveness from God in the spiritual sense. Uh, they liked a few more, and then I'll just close it there, and I'll, I'll probably preach next week, actually. So Exodus 32, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So they say this, See, whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. We've all sinned, right? But let's see what it says in Revelation 3 about blotting out of the book. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in raiment, raiment, white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So someone that's saved, right, clothed in white raiment, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name uh, before my father, which is before his angels. And we see this in 1 John 5. Uh, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Right? And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So I like that comparison to he that overcometh in verse 5. But who is it overcometh in 1 John 5? That believeth on the Son, uh, that, Je that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God, that he believed on Jesus Christ to be saved. So this wouldn't make, this does not apply to us, Exodus 32, that he will not. Yes, like as we see in, in Reve uh, I didn't show you the passage in, in uh, when Paul's writing in Romans that, you know, when sin revived, I died. Because once, once, you, once you sin, once from a child you know sin, and then obviously that's the point where you now are condemned. But we know that children, the babies go to heaven because they, they don't have that conscience. God doesn't apply to them. But when sin revived, I died. And that, that would be this case. That whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blood out of my book. But then we see that people that are, are in the book will not be blotted out. And who are the people that are in the book? He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. He that believeth on Jesus Christ, even his faith. I did want to touch on Hebrews 6 and 10. I think I got a good grasp of it now, but I'll, I'll leave it there. The time is... Uh, running short. So I'll leave it there. Hopefully you learned something. There's a lot more verses, obviously. A lot of the passages in, in John particularly about losing. You cannot lose your salvation. Christ paid once for all uh, for our salvation in Hebrews 10, you know, for by, by, by which will we are, uh, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Right? Um, and so we see that in every case that we are saved, once saved, always saved. You know, that should, that, that should give us assurance that, yes, in the flesh, we might face things in this world, we might, we might struggle, we might have temptation, we might turn to the world, but we can always go back to God. We can go enter into His throne of grace boldly. All right, so eternal security, you know, if I didn't have that in my mind, I'd be like, oh, am I saved? Am I saved? I'd be so scared. But I'm so glad that I can trust in Christ, that I can go to Him um, with all my burdens and labors, right? So let's close there. Hopefully you learned something and you can use it this, for this week. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you, Lord, for the time we've had this morning. We can open your scriptures and we can learn and understand uh, what the scriptures are. That we, we thank you, God, that you died once for all, for all of us, that we're sanctified forever. That yes, as, as your child, even in the flesh we still sin, uh, but that's the old man, God, and that we will uh, chastise us for that. But help us, God, to live clean lives, to serve you, and prune us that we bring more forth fruit, or bring forth more fruit. Um, but we thank you for the assurance of salvation, that we can never lose it, that you'll not blot us out, and that you've saved us, Lord. Praise be to you. Thank you that you paid for all of our sins, and that we could, didn't have to earn it ourselves. We could never earn it. And we thank you, God, for that. So I ask all these things in your precious, holy, wonderful name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.